there used to be one retired colonel with handlebar mustache <laughs> 12 bore gun in his hand mm. and trying to protect his daughter from everyone around and he would be carrying that gun even inside his house and now that image has to change soldiering is a serious business mm. the storytelling about soldier has to be done very very seriously we can't say that i am making a movie in the but then commercial compulsions want there should be a dance sequence in that there should be a song sequence in this how mm. can you have a dance and song on the border my wife has uh, heard my death news twice really once when she was uh, i think 8 months pregnant did declared you dead yes they she saw on the tv she did not want the other jawans or the officers wives to see tomorrow morning her in a shattered condition she held herself together and showed as if it's okay you can imagine the strength our families have that is how their sacrifice their contribution in the soldier's life must be acknowledged or appreciated and honored i think they are the most powerful women on this planet so we've done a bunch of military podcasts where we spoke about combat operations military life the special forces but we've never spoken to someone who holds this kind of a rank in the military who's served in this manner in the military tiny dhillon so or kgs dhillon served as the head of the defense intelligence agency what does that even mean i'll let him explain it over the course of this particular podcast we covered aspects of geopolitics we covered military life obviously but moreover we covered a macro view of the military what it takes to actually operate the military as a whole and we also spoke about how the indian military the indian armed forces is perceiving the present times i highly recommend that you also check out the hindi episode we did with tiny sir it's incredible if you understand hindi you'll be unlocking another portal of knowledge with that particular episode but if you want to unlock portals of knowledge anyway make sure you follow us on spotify we're a spotify exclusive every episode's available on spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world kgs dhillo so on the ranbir show spreading knowledge spreading perspectives it's another powerful Indian Armed Forces episode. Lieutenant General K J S Dillon, sir, we did an incredible Hindi episode. <laughs> Welcome to T R S English. Thank you. How are you, sir? Oh, always great. Okay, you had a good time on Hindi. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, I'm thinking we make this a quick and snappy episode. Mm -hmm. It's primarily self-education here. Uh, you know, I've had lots of military veterans on the show. You are one of our most highly requested military veterans because of your Twitter presence, because of your entire military tenure. There's a lot of curiosity about you, and I highly recommend that audiences, especially if you all understand Hindi, go check out our Hindi podcast for some incredible. Uh, prequel insights but this one's kind of a more present times episode so so did you have fun on the hindi one yeah absolutely enjoyed it tiny sir yeah. why do they call you tiny sir you're easily 62 63 at least 63 you're 63 <laughs> and you're an imposing figure like i can tell that you know this is there weight training that's gone into this a lot of it <laughs> <laughs> like your bone structure everything is like you know really strong i wouldn't want to face you in combat <laughs> but <laughs> we are friends <laughs> <laughs> but i have to actually ask you this sir with your kind of frame and your 63 your weight training so you're a wide guy and you've got punjabi genetics <laughs> so uh, is that an advantage in combat or is it a disadvantage because i'm assuming if you're a smaller guy maybe you're able to maneuver more easily but correct me if i'm wrong see uh, gone are the days of physical combat mm. the trench warfare of first world war second world war where you are physically assaulting an enemy the bayonet fixed and at times you get into a close quarter combat mm. these days it happens very rarely in a conflict situation or a combat situation with counter terrorist during counter terrorist operation where the terrorist is running out and you weapon has dropped or somewhere you got hold of him and you don't want the collateral damage so in that type of a situation maybe there is a you know close quarter battle otherwise as officers mm. the your height your weight and other things they don't matter mm. 
what matters it is a your thinking faculties mm. your leadership qualities how you can assess the situation how you can plan your next move and how you can lead your men with valor courage and uh, bravery yeah that is what matters and in that the physical appearance has got no place okay um back when you were very actively a combat soldier i'm assuming that at a certain age um maybe the army doesn't allow you in combat it probably works just like a sport because physical faculties start withering off at a certain age but back when you were like actively involved in combat were there any hand to hand combat situations that you had to go through uh, not uh, individually okay not individually but there were instances especially in the built up areas during counter terrorist or counter insurgent operations where an insurgent or terrorist was trying to escape the cordon and the boy had caught him but he didn't want to fire because the fire at that situation can go into a neighboring house and you mm. know injure a innocent civilian mm. so at that time the minimum use of force is the norm in such situations very direct question again i always fear bringing up the topic of movies about the military with actual military vets uh which side are you on are you okay with military movies or do you think that it's not a correct dis- uh, depiction which i'm sure it's not in many ways but does that anger you or like i mean just generally what's your opinion on military movies see uh, communication expressing yourself showcasing what you are doing keeping the security as confidentiality as per mind i am all for it mm. our operations especially in counter terrorist and counter insurgency areas are so transparent we need to tell our stories why we need to tell the public national and international this is how we conduct our operation so there is a very false narratives being made by the the enemies of the state or people who are not friendly to india mm. we need to counter that narrative with actions mm. truth prevails mm. transparency prevails no narrative building will have any ground to stand on if other party is telling the truth and transparently so how are those uh, enemies building the narratives through social media there is a, a whole lot of machinery into it okay social media is one part of it diplomatic efforts are there political efforts are there and all other types of engineering of mind of various uh, people so but when you tell a story suppose i have to make a so some sort of a serial on indian army's operations in kashmir i must do thorough research mm. starting from what type of recruitments the uniform they wear if a person is 20 years of age or 25 years of age he has to be a captain maximum major no he can't be a lieutenant general so it has to align to the reality reality then it becomes uh, unfortunately i don't want to say it but i have to say it indian cinema the research work in the defense related movies although it has come of age lot has changed but there's still lot to be desired yeah and i hear this as a general narrative from the indian military yes and because it's not that uh, i am from down if you are say whatever you are doing if your pro- profession is projected mm. and there are lacunas in that image mm. you would feel bad and then the image being projected is not correct yeah i'll give you a small example uh, in 70s and 80s the hindi movies which came they used to be one retired colonel with handlebar mustache <laughs> 12 bore gun in his hand mm. and trying to protect his daughter from everyone around and he would be carrying that gun even inside his house mm. i just told on uh, some other program this and now that image has to change mm. yeah it's a soldiering is a serious business mm. the storytelling about soldier has to be done very very seriously yeah. we can't say that i am making a movie in the but then commercial compulsions want there should be a dance sequence in there there should be a song sequence in this how mm. can you have a dance and song on the border what's your favorite war movie that you ever seen a lot of them okay <laughs> a lot of them and uh, at the intellectual level there are very little known movie in india at least sure. international the movie is called breaker morant okay it's about a boer war in uh, south africa okay and it's about a australian uh, officer 
was working with a British officer and there's a more of a uh, court martial movie. Why intellectual level? Why I'm saying it's, it's not that physical violence is not there. Mm. there. There is a little bit of it. And it's not that uh, the armies are fighting. It's a very specific incident has happened. And then that officer is put through a court martial. So 70% of the movies of court martial and pros and cons and trying to question the ethos and ethics and uh, you know, why is and, why is and ifs and buts of it. So it's a very intense movie from that point of view. Okay. I like that movie. And from a more action perspective, any any movie that you felt got it right in terms of real combat scenarios or real army scenarios? You know, a lot of good movies. Uh, Where Eagles Dare, The Saving Private Train, hmm. and uh, even the World War movies and all. I think most of them are very good movies. Uh, so Saving Private Ryan is a very intense movie. It's a very intense movie. Uh, and, and, and let me tell you, a lot of uh, young boys and girls might feel soldiering is all about firing and uh, killing. No, a soldier is a very, very human person. Hmm. He's a very emotional person. Because children get emotional when they cannot meet the targets at the end of the quarter or a month. For him, the targets are how many deaths he has avoided, how many soldiers or buddies he has saved, how many enemies of the nation he has eliminated. Yeah. His quantification is different. Now look at that. Some people can't see a blood, see blood in the on the TV screen. Yeah. Now he's seeing it day in and day out. His emotional strength has to be understood. He's staying away from his family. His wife is managing the household, the children, the upbringing, looking after the old parents, the looking after the property, all by herself in the village. Yeah. He being aware of all these issues, still giving his 200% on the front. This man, his contribution has to be acknowledged, understood, and appreciated. Um, you know, maybe for deeper context on what you just spoke about, I actually want to highlight Saving Private Ryan's beginning, you know, where they've shown D-Day, I believe. Um, mm. Do you remember that scene, the way yeah. they've shot it? Uh, for those who don't know about D-Day, basically it was one very important event in the history of World War II. It was towards the end of World War II where American soldiers, uh, the Allied soldiers actually invaded uh, a French beach where they had to take on German soldiers who were on the beach. So the beginning of Saving Private Ryan is a very intense scene where they've shown what happens when you're actually in a scenario like that. And it's one of those movies that it puts you at the edge of your seat right from the beginning and it's difficult to watch. The beginning is... Extremely difficult because of the way they've shot it. They show guts falling out. Uh, they show people screaming, people with like their hands blown out. Um, that's what I want to highlight here as well. So when you're talking about this seeing blood day in, day out, the intensity that they've shown in that D-Day scene, is that more common than most civilians think? See, uh, Second World War was a very, very you can say bloody war. A lot of young boys, because their conscription, the young boys as young as 15, 16, 17, were also taken to the battlefront. Mm. And the casualties, because it was a contact warfare, the physical contact and there were men dying. Yeah. There were civilians dying. So the intensity of that war was different in terms of physical human losses. And injury. And injuries. And the impact on the psyche. Whereas what we are discussing today is the like Indian Army has fought 71 war, 65 war, we have fought on Kargil, and then counter-terrorist counter thing. Here, things are different. And then, of course, little bit of picturization, the intensity was highlighted also. But for a given individual, when his body gets hit, then that hand blowing off or the intestines coming out, can happen to anyone in the combat zone. Have you been close to death at any point? My wife has uh, heard my death news twice. Really? Once when she was, uh, I think, uh, eight months pregnant. They declared you dead? Yes. They, she saw on the TV my death news. And uh, not declared me death. There was some misunderstanding. I have written a book which is coming out uh, now. Kitne Gazi Gai, Kitne Gazi Gai. In that... This aspect, the emotional aspect which you talked about now that the topic has come up, is given out very, very detail in good detail. Like a soldier is doing his duty, they are just now saying the wife holds the family together. 
the wife, the father, the mother, the children, their sacrifice goes unnoticed. Mm. Like in my case, both the times, I've written in great detail about this in my book, but both the times I was not present when my children are born. Both the times are not present when they joined their college. Both the times are not present when they joined their professional college. Both the times are not present when they did their 10th or did their 12th. And she managed all by herself. In addition, there's news of uh, husband being dead. One news got clarified after 12 hours. Why? But what was the logic? See, well, first time it happened. Second time my wife was uh, pregnant, about eight months pregnant. Uh, when this uh, news came and she saw it on the TV that the first time this happened, Major Swenso killed in Lolab. That is the year I was posted in North Kashmir. Major, my name, KJ Singh of Rashtriya Rifles. And she, the whole night she could not sleep but she also felt <clears throat> she was staying with her parents. Her parents were old that tomorrow morning they should not uh, get the news first. She had to prepare them. And then when the newspaper came, newspaper had the same uh, news. She hid the newspaper from her parents. Did not cry, did not show her emotions and kept it to herself. And she was pregnant. Now this is the strength of the second time I was a commanding officer. Again, two children. One was just about uh, two years old, three years old. And one was about eight, nine years old. She again got the news in the night. Again, Colonel K.J. Singh in JNK killed. And she again, the whole night, she could not sleep. And here, something very important happened. Now, she is a commanding officer's wife. She did not want the other Joans or the officer's wives to see tomorrow morning her in a shattered condition. She held herself together and showed as if it's okay. You can imagine the strength our families have. Yeah. That is how they are, their sacrifice, their contribution in the soldier's life must be acknowledged appreciated and honored. I think they are the most powerful women on this planet. So I think one of the phases most associated with your tenure is your time in Kashmir. And uh, even if someone reads your Wikipedia page, it's very evident that you worked a lot towards peace. Like you actually encouraged the mothers of the insurgents to convince them to not be insurgents. And um, I think that's a very noble way of uh, kind of putting the right message across and trying to do things in the right way. But I also want to ask you a very brutal question here, which is that civilians who are sitting in Mumbai, Delhi, etc. What do they not understand about the reality of Kashmir? You've had six tenures, I believe. Uh, six in Kashmir, seven in Jammu and Kashmir, total eight tenures in counter-terrorist counter-incidence areas. Beginning in 1990, up till as recently as? 2020. Okay. What has changed in Kashmir? And what do civilians not understand about the reality? Because civilians will turn to one news channel and they'll say something. Another news channel will say the complete opposite. Traditional news media has lost its reputation because of these things. We're not getting into the details of why they sway in either direction. But I want to know from a soldier, what's the reality on ground? See, Kashmir or Jammu and Kashmir issue. Uh, without going into much of a history, I'll just restrict to the terrorist terrorism point of view. Pakistan wanted Kashmir to be destabilized, to be unhappy. And Pakistan wanted something to keep projecting that Kashmir card so that people don't ask them the questions about their domestic failures. Hmm. May it be political, may it be economic, and may it be military or whatever diplomatic, which have now become very pronounced in Pakistan's uh, own uh, backyard. They are an economic mess. They have so much of uh, political issues and all those things. So one thing which binds them together is Kashmir. So they wanted Kashmir to keep burning. 
so when it happened in 89 when it started i was there as a young captain 88 first time i went to kashmir when the kashmiri pandits came out i'll tell you why this thing is kashmiri pandits came out the population demography changed kashmiri pandits were basically in through the education profession plus uh, other businesses but the education collapsed the village schools which were made of wood those days those were burned down by terrorist so children were not getting good education because good teachers had left most of them mm. and there was a problem there afterwards the huriyat the hartals or lockdowns started every second day used to be kashmir lockdown or this for that reason or this reason and the schools won't open the children would not go to school for 200 to 250 days in a year because of these lockdowns you can pick up your grocery if you feel there three days lockdown today you can pick up after three days of another seven days but you cannot catch up on your syllabus which you have missed mm. about 80% of the classes then they were promoted in mass without exams as a result the base of education was very weak then they come to 10th 12th class when they have to compete for getting admission in good professional college or good universities so naturally when the child has not been through a good education upbringing they could not compete now because of 370 and 35a mostly 35a the industry or the multinational corporations were not allowed to come into kashmir for establishing industry so the job opportunities were less economic growth was less mm. and because of terrorism kashmir is a basically a tourism oriented uh, society and agrarian society basically fruits and when the terrorism was there the tourists stopped coming so the lot of hoteliers lot of uh, transport businesses shopkeepers they lost their income coupled with this in 1990 when india opened up to world economy and world became a global village 1990 the time when terrorism started in kashmir mm. here there was economic growth happening job creation happening there the education going down the economic growth going down the job creation going down and what happened in the end when the boy could not get into a good university good college <clears throat> he was like a cannon fodder for the terrorist to be recruited and this is exactly what pakistan wanted pakistan did not want this young kashmiri boys to get good education good job then they will not ask for what pakistan is asking yeah so the whole ecosystem which worked towards it and now after 5th of august 2019 the 370 having been abrogated there a lot of investment which is going in there a lot of peace which is happening there a lot of awareness which has come in so things are on the upward graph now and i am sure they will change for good what about that lost generation of children which didn't get good education but are also not becoming insurgents what are they up to now kashmiri society is a very intellectual society okay they are a very aware society they are very education oriented society hmm they are poets they are musicians they are artisans they are you know different types of art maybe carpets maybe paper mache maybe walnut wood or what have you hmm. so this whole generation which you are talking about it's not the generation which suffered it is the society which suffered a society which was so intellectual which was so nice now today two third of the population of jammu and kashmir is below the age of 30 hmm. and they have grown up under the gun culture like i always say so that society that gap in that generation or the age group is what we have to understand yeah two third of the population has seen this terrorism happening day in and day out in their neighborhood in their own houses yeah so we need to understand the psychology psych of uh, this generation and need to be more human towards their cause and their feelings because all of them are not terrorists let me be very clear mm. the people who are terrorists or people who are terror sympathizers they are in single digit yeah normal kashmiri just wants his daily life his good education good hospital facilities good you know job uh, opportunities and peaceful life with the family hmm. 
um so what's the reality of pakistan occupied kashmir it's a aspect of the world which is very i'd say it's probably not understood enough by indian citizens what's the reality of that land right now like if you go there right now what's happening there all over is it peaceful is it a hotbed of insurgency what's happening i mean we know the answer See, but just, i want i'll just give you a little background to uh, because some of the audience may not understand why pakistan occupied kashmir is when kashmir acceded to india hmm on a legal document pakistan sent in their raiders to occupy kashmir by force and they were almost on the outskirts of srinagar when the indian army went in and pushed them back they have been pushed back from the kashmir valley passe but some part of the astwal jammu and kashmir including gilgit baltistan and some areas of jammu and kashmir are still with them because they could only be pushed up to a particular place because it was month of october then the winters came in the passes got covered and there was a river obstacles so that area which is still under pakistan control outside the kashmir valley per se is called pakistan occupied kashmir they are also same kashmiri people there the brothers who are this side and that side of the line of control the situation there is such good thing which happened was the internet the social media the you know global village concept and there was a bus service which was started between pakistan occupied kashmir and kashmir oh so anyone who went to pakistan occupied kashmir spent few days there with their relatives came back he came and told the horror stories the neglect which pakistan occupied kashmir was undergoing the lack of education higher education facilities like today the nine medical colleges which are coming up or were only there in jnk mm. whereas that said they nil mm. the type of job opportunity which are now getting created this side the airports the hospitals the iits the iims which are coming up it's a, it's a it's a world of a difference mm. so that is now becoming clear because of the social media and the internet got it and people going and physically seeing it honestly so this podcast is a lot of kashmir education for me as well and i feel so many people who appear on these news channels with strong opinions about it is it fair to say that they're not fully informed about the reality uh i will not specifically talk about anyone i will say anyone who has not been to kashmir is an opinion maker on kashmir mm. i'll tell you one small anecdote i was a core commander in kashmir yeah and uh, 370 abrogation had taken place and a top newspaper chief editor wanted to come to kashmir and interview me so we fixed up the date and time and he flew in from delhi and and say the time was fixed say 11 o'clock or so he came at about 10:30 so my staff told me sir gentleman is here i said okay we can finish off the thing so he came in and he says sir i'm very sorry i underestimated overestimated the travel time i came a little faster so i said yes generally it takes that much time from the airport he said but i was thinking there is a lockdown i'm talking about post 5th of august there is a lockdown there will be a lot of checking lot of places i'll be held up at the barrier and asked to prove my id and it will take me a long time so i said no nothing like that happened he said yes sir. the call shops are open all roads are open traffic is moving around freely there is no road blocks there are no barriers and that's how i reached half an hour early so mm. i said uh, you, who's telling you okay, there was a lockdown there no nothing called lockdown mm. he said also but the whole uh, media is saying there is a lockdown in kashmir i told him i said you you are the media you are a newspaper editor mm. and then comes the beauty then he says sir actually i write uh, twice a month i write an article on kashmir in uh, editorial column so i thought i must go and see kashmir <laughs> no he is not been to kashmir mm. he is writing editorial articles on kashmir and he has a perception even being in the media which is supposed to be aware of things yeah and that is what i am saying the narrative building about kashmir about wrong things going around kashmir are all narrative building pakistan till today is saying kashmir there is a lockdown mm. where there are movie shootings which are happening in uh, kashmir yeah so there that's why if anyone who comes on the tv where 
they can influence a young mind my request would be you should have done your homework you should be an expert on the subject and you should know the topic because you spent so much time in kashmir sir please feel free not to answer this also um you witnessed the kashmiri pandit exodus yes i was a young captain in north kashmir in district kopwara and uh, on 19th january 1990 before that we i reached there in september 1988 and i was there till uh, better part of uh, 1990 so i witnessed the situation at that time however since i was only a captain and in a particular area with a particular area of responsibility i written about this in a great detail in my book because what happened on that day what happened prior to that and lot of people even question as to why the army didn't do anything can you give a gist like i told you kashmiri pandits left education system collapsed the ecosystem of huriyat terrorist and all those people anyone who didn't align with them got killed they made sure the society remained uneducated the socio political economic aspects outcomes of this Econo- social outcome there is a very deep rooted thing you will see no sayed no you know higher caste chap getting killed in encounter they all the controllers of terrorism there is a cannon fodder caste which gets killed in the encounters economics because of the terrorism because of lack of education because of lack of good opportunities good infrastructure good development no peace economic development has not happened because the education had not happened economic development has not happened the job creation is not there yeah there no mnc's uh, which have come in because of 35a and tourism society basically everyone depend on tourism because there was no peace tourists tourists were scared to go at times the terrorist even killed the tourists yeah Wh- whose fault not a kashmiri locals fault but he suffered okay very unrelated question do you believe in karma yes you believe that actions have consequences see uh, i will say every man is responsible for himself for his actions yeah. but as a military commander i am also responsible for the well being of my men under my command for me karma is not only that i do good karma so i'll get the good results in this life or the next life or my children will uh, get a uh, you know good uh, result because of the karma for me karma is instant yeah if i am a good commander if i do my planning properly i conduct my operations properly i lead my team properly my actions are judicious justified and transparent i'll come back with my men safe i'll come back myself safe yeah so karma is granting me immediately but the point which you are making you know every indian has got that feeling somewhere at the back of the mind and i am no different but i would want to do the thing rightly in the right manner as a part of the team yes sir for the overall good of my team yeah um the reason i ask you this is because i've been reading about this concept called collective karma which means that societies in general also hold a certain karma that if a society is inflicting pain or a country is inflicting inflicting pain on another country it's going to come back at some point which makes me think about pakistan in general after the two podcasts we've done it has been responsible the isi has been responsible for you know creating havoc in this one area um what i wish to ask you is um, you know what's happening inside pakistan right now as well not just economically what i believe is that a lot of news is actually blocked in mainstream media in pakistan from the geopolitical analysts that we've had on the show they speak about the revolts happening in places like baluchistan northwest front frontier province there are parts of pakistan that don't want to be a part of it is that true and i'm asking you for your objective geopolitical opinion here i will sum up in one line sure the whole thing which you have talked about pakistan and the karma and other things a very uh, important world leader had told pakistan if you have snakes in your backyard you can't expect them to bite your neighbor only mm. so this one statement sums up the whole thing got what pakistan has done over the decades the the terrorists are going to come back yeah so 
they are not only going to be di- directed towards one side mm. so i'll leave it at that one military question mm-hmm. india has a very large border it's like so curvy inside out how do you possibly patrol the entire border are there like modern satellite systems like i i just don't understand how such a la- large landmass can be completely protected and is it a scientific problem that the military is trying to solve for constantly uh just for the benefit of the audience sure the highest battlefield on earth is siachen glacier india is fighting there and on the other extreme of the spectrum india is also protecting its island territories that is the mean sea level yeah so from mean sea level right up to the highest battlefield that's on himalayas in between we have all types of borders may it be high altitude may it be mountains may it be riverine may it be deserts may it be jungles may it be coastal line so we as a military or as a nation are guarding all these borders and with two nuclear neighbors mm. who are not very friendly so the question which you asked there is a mix and match of everything okay there is a electronic uh, surveillance means which are available the physical holding of areas which is definitely there and the physical blocking of areas for a specific period of time coupled with the electronic means of surveillance they can be ground based they can be raised platform based they can be you know from the third dimension so all this coupled together form a very nice network of border management okay is drone warfare or drone surveillance becoming more and more important in modern day military life uh, as far as i understand in the same way that we have army navy air force we spoken about cyber and space on the last podcast one thing i didn't touch upon is drones has it come to the forefront truly see warfare like any other field is a dynamic and evolving field hmm. from spears and swords to horse cavalry to foot infantry to tanks to guns to helicopters to aerial warships and you know attack helicopters and the evolving evol- evolution is still going on yeah drones are just one part of it okay. okay in the recent times yes they have gained certain relevance and importance and but they are not a stand alone system they are part of the overall war fighting network mm. but yes in the last few or the one decade plus they are becoming more and more pronounced their use is becoming more and more lethal and multifaceted offense is the best form of defense yes that's something i know every military man believes in strongly we talk about cyber attacks happening on us or on civilians etc i am 110% sure that there is a cyber unit in the military as well you don't need to elaborate on it so if if you think it's inappropriate and pardon me if i've asked you something that's too much where i've crossed the line um, no i'll tell you uh, we have a defense cyber agency okay which works under the headquarter ideas under the cds we have the defense space agency okay which also works under the headquarter ideas and the cds and they also work in conjunction with other assets of the government other agencies who are dealing with the similar topics and subjects non military agencies and like uh, i was uh, in the cds secretary at function my last appointment they work very closely mm. they exchange notes on real time basis so it's not that uh, one is working in a different silo they are very cohesive coherent and integrated way of functioning between yeah. these agencies yeah so they are there and it's an open secret i'm not uh, telling you okay. anything which is uh, classified <laughs> again one more question because i'm enjoying talking to you sir mm-hmm. it's not every day that you get a chance to talk to someone like yourself um you know when you talk about these agencies secret services of india or even the cyber warfare unit of the indian military i'm sure there is a very well thought out recruitment process which is not going to be the same as recruiting people for the actual military not the army navy air force that's a whole other process because their human beings are the weapons here it's much more about probably the human mind being the weapon 
so um my question is really there are some uh, kind of situations that happen in the public eye where the military is keeping an eye on it and recruiting the best talent out of india am i right in saying that because that's what there's the youth a, hopes for there is a two way uh, manning of these agencies okay one is uh, you go for a tenure you come back but your aptitude and your qualification that's from the regular uh, military if you are you are having the qualification which is required in these agencies and you have the aptitude and you are updated because you done some course or something then you go for 2 years 3 years extendable to 5 years or whatever time so but these people's career where does it start like do they, they come they from are, they start as a proper military professionals you're talking about like secret service no i'm talking about the cyber and space and other things okay okay and even the secret services it's there is there is also in the secret services also there is there are vacancies of all the other uh, services okay so person who has the aptitude they are taken on deputation at times they are absorbed permanently so there are various uh, you know ways they can work for these agencies or the foreign services so, without going into detail it's it's the best man for the job okay and these are He, recruited from military colleges but they are recruiting from all over depending on if the chap is serving in the police okay he has the aptitude and talent he is picked up and taken there is found suitable is retained he can be there for 3 years 5 years 10 years come back to his parent cadre or he can continue in that cadre okay. so uh, it's nothing bad here okay aim is to pick up the best who can do the best job for the country right I'm and just, he can be picked up from uh, any service yeah i'm just drawing out a very hypothetical scenario suppose there is a hackathon you know these coders come together to code something very elaborate would the indian secret services actually go to that hackathon keep a track of who's the best coder and then pull them no, in no they the the people who are responsible like cert and all people who are responsible for uh, you know defense against all these hackings and all they do conduct uh, hacker conferences and all okay and uh, if they find someone uh, suitable i'm sure uh, so i won't know the details of it yeah. but i'm sure if this chap is good and he's got the potential uh, he must be taken in yeah at the end of the day aim is that his qualities or his potential must be used for the good of the nation you need the muscle of the mind sometimes yes in these situations i'm assuming that it's the sharpest um, most capable minds out of all these yes tools. of the available uh, assets resources right and i'm sure they would be having procedures and ways and means to select who's very good okay and then taking even depending on their requirements got you okay this is the juiciest portion of both the podcast which i have been like looking forward to from the time we met you in that room um i know you can't go into the details of this but on a very surface level just for education purposes what is the defense intelligence agency because you headed it what does that mean for teenagers listening to it what does intelligence mean you know when you say oh intelligence agency etc like there's a very foggy idea people think of james bond people think of spies people think of raw how is this different from raw does it work with raw what's happening okay defense intelligence agency is an agency of the defense which collects intelligence what is intelligence <laughs> so intelligence is synthesizing of corroboration of information which is available from various domains okay you have information coming from 10 sources you sift it together you synthesize it you filter it then there's some voids you task an agency which is probably better in equation in terms you fill up that void you make the int picture or the entire picture once it is confirmed intelligence picture then the information which had been gathered is called intelligence once it has got some intelligence weight in it yeah now intelligence is of two types one is red hot intelligence as the civilian would understand that information on which or intelligence on which you have to act immediately otherwise it will go bad this thing the four terrorists are sitting in that hut at now if you don't act in next 30 minutes they would move out mm. then this intelligence is of no use so such like intelligence is even if there's a little bit of void then you launch and on ground you go and confirm by various means second is a background intelligence you collected this intelligence and all you realize like you would have seen in a lot of movies 
where the sleeper cells have been identified you mean terrorist but they are not acted against the agencies wait for the opportune moment probably when all the you know components are together or probably when there's a big fish which has come in or probably when they're just about to launch some very sensational uh, attack so they will hit at that time mm. so that is called background intelligence so there are different types of it and uh, the question about uh, functioning with other agency like i told you all intelligence agencies in the country they work in a very cohesive manner and they meet practically every day every day there is a physical meeting and electronic uh, flow of information is real time between all the agencies okay this is to make the youth aware that things are happening in the right way on the previous podcast you said that the indian military is always engaged in some form of operation now i am assuming that before you strategize for the operation the step involved is gathering of intelligence and that's where the defense intelligence agency really comes into play for military based operations you're gathering all the information for the boys to actually go out and perform the operation efficiently without a loss of life am i correct in saying this see what i said in the previous uh, in the podcast was any military which is not in continuous operations or which stays away from operations for a very long time they get a little jarred so when the day of the operation they may not be up to it so it's mm. always good and indian army that way is better because we are always in some sort of a operational area after every peace tenure right. now coming to the point about how the operation and how the intelligence if you have to buy a tv what do you do research you search the net mm. you ask your friend who had bought a particular thing how is this tv working you will say it's good you ask other friend he said oh, mine is better now this is intelligence gathering mm. once all this intelligence or the information has come to you then you start working out which is the best option okay but then you realize you don't have that type of money mm. then you go for the second best mm. similarly when you are gathering information intelligence you come to the best possible way of carrying out operation but then you realize for this i need these resources if they there go for it if those resources are not there and you can't wait for them to build up then you probably do and there comes in the leadership there comes in the planning creativity we we call it uh, you know in the military terms we call it how the leaders plan okay and a good leadership can make a difference between the defeat and victory yeah okay. because same resources when employed in a particular manner may give a x dividend but the same resources when their orchest- orchestration is done differently can give you x plus uh, dividends so Wait. all these things and then operational logistics as i said they are very important component of any operational planning i'm asking this very respectfully um again because this is a question that we've brought up on the podcast a couple of years ago um i think we'd asked uh, gd bakshi sir about this and that time there wasn't enough information about it but whatever had happened with bipin rawat sir um has has the military now understood it's just a yes or no question because See, they- it is uh, accidents happen the court of inquiry has been conducted in this incident also and any other Uh, accidents of uh, helicopters or uh, crafts which happen a court of inquiry is a must and once the court of inquiry is conducted whatever the outcome whatever the reasons for it and then they are improved upon mm. whether it's a technical uh, issue or whether it's a judgmental issue or whatever it is whether issue and all so in all accidents which happen in the army even if there is a small accident i just got a scrape on my finger there is a court of inquiry so that it does not get repeated so in this case also i'm sure the court of inquiry was held and it is uh, in place okay you had worked with him yes i was uh, deputy chief of defense staff uh, integrated defense staff and looking after intelligence and of course i was the corps commander when he was the chief i was the bgs in the core headquarters when he was the goc i was the brigade commander his neighboring brigade commander when he was the goc in baramulla i was neighboring brigade commander in handwara i worked very closely with him there was brotherhood he was a solid commander 
lot of combat experience, very sharp. He will pick up a thing like this, give a decision like this, and he will stand by his coordinates. He had a great vision for future and the perfect commander which you can look for. A military man to the hilt. Why perfect commander? What I'm saying is, he was the man who could gauge your work. He would give you a job and let you do the job. And he is not the one who will keep interfering with you every now and then. He will guide you. He will enable you. He will give you additional resources. He was uh, very good, visionary. Yeah. What is his legacy for the Indian military? All uh, great commanders, all great leaders leave a legacy where people get um, uh, you know, influenced by them, motivated by them. And uh, there are a lot of people who are motivated by his way of functioning, those who served with him, myself included. Yeah. The way he worked in Kashmir, the way he worked in various combat areas in Northeast and other places, and as a chief and CDS, great man. Yeah. Um, again, it's an honor that I'm getting to talk to such a high ranking military officer. Just sliding that in, that's what I've been feeling throughout these two. So every question I'm asking you, while it's direct, I mean it with a lot of respect. And I don't mean to cross yeah. any line with you. At the cost of making this a little dark, there's someone who's seen a lot of death and death very up close. And I'm sure your uh, appreciation for life in, in increases a lot, you know, um, especially at the end of your military tenure or so. The, I've been in combat situations since captain days. Captain, major, lieutenant, colonel, CEO, brigade commander. The first death which, unfortunate incident which happened under my command was when I was a brigadier. I still remember last night, Pate Tashuk. I written about great detail about this incident also, because that was the first death under my command, where a soldier lost his life in the line of duty after four or five years. The most difficult part of any commander's duty is to lay the wreath on the mortal remains, which as a corps commander, I had to perform that duty for a few occasions, including Pulwama. After Pulwama, that uh, incident, when we killed them in 100 hours, we lost people. We lost Major Dondair and the uh, soldiers. So the most difficult job of a commander in his lifetime is to lay the wreath on the mortal remains before they are sent to their next of kin to their homes. So it's a, it's a very, what do I say? It's a job you have to do. It's the job which you can't say I don't like. It's the job where you got to minimize your casualties. And nation wants you to do that job and you have to do it. There's no turning back. But it is a difficult moment when you lose a man. And I have invariably been in the hospital whenever the casualty comes to the hospital. So that, you know, last minute, Somebody should not falter for some small little thing. I will give a decision then and there, let go. Money is not a criteria at all. Nothing stops if you can save a man. The doctors in 92 base hospitals in Kashmir, Srinagar, are the best you can have. I've seen them reviving almost dying patients. So every evening, you come back with that feeling that I saved someone. Yeah. And as a commander, my biggest responsibility is towards my command, towards the men I command. Tiny sir, my God. <laughs> Heavy talking to you. Uh, be it all the information or just perspectives. Want to learn from you more in life. And um, before I let you go at the end of today's episode, I have to ask you a little bit about your book, which I'm very keen on reading. I feel there's, there's a lot of heavy stuff in there. What would you like to say about your book to the viewers? See, this book is a life story from the day I was three years old till abrogation of Article 370 and time after that. So it's a journey of that small three-year-old child, his struggles, which actually started at three years of age, how he faced the challenges, how he failed, how he fell down, how he got up, you know, cleaned himself and ran again how he failed again. The lesson here is one failure or two failures don't make you a failure. That gives you energy to win again. And from there, it's about marriage, it's about unit life, NDA, IMA training, lot of anecdotes, 
द मैरिज लाइफ अर्ली मैरिज चिल्ड्रन बर्थ चैलेंजेस द वाइफ स्पॉट द चिल्ड्रन स्पॉट देन कश्मीर सेवेंटी परसेंट बुक इज ऑन कश्मीर स्टार्टिंग विद नाइनटीन एटी एट राष्ट्र राइफल्स सिर्फ नाम ही काफ़ी है सर्वाइवल यू सैड आर्मी मार्च इज ऑन स्टमक द फुल चैप्टर ऑन सर्वाइवल स्किल हाउ आर्मी सर्वाइव्स वैन देर नो रशंस वट आर द थिंग्स वी डू सो इफ एनी वन इज वॉन्टिंग टू ज्वाइन द आर्मी बॉय और गर्ल इट्स अ फर्स्ट एंड गाइड इफ एनी वन वॉन्ट्स टू मैरी एन आर्मी बॉय और आर्मी गर्ल इट्स अगेन अ फर्स्ट एंड गाइड एंड इट्स अबाउट चैलेंजेस फ्रॉम अ यंग थ्री ईयर ओल्ड बॉय टू अ यंग लेफ्टिनेंट टू अ लेफ्टिनेंट जनरल द लेवल्स ऑफ चैलेंजेस डिफर चैलेंजेस रिमेन एंड हाउ यू कन्वर्ट दम इन टू अपॉर्चुनिटीज is what is the crux of this book Thank aim you. being only to tell the youngsters what they coming into if they you know army aspirants and the name of the book is kitne gazi aaye kitne gazi gaye cover is just released i am sure uh, i'll send it to you yes we put it right here in this part of the podcast um uh, i think you know how grateful i am by this point in the show once again sir i salute you thank, thank you for you your service much. and thank you for giving us two incredible episodes i highly recommend listeners go check out our hindi episode as well so and uh, hoping to see you again on the ranveer show thank you thank you so thank you much that was the episode for today if you enjoyed it make sure you hit that like button share this episode with as many indians as is possible we roam around in cities where people often refuse to even talk about geopolitics they refuse to talk about aspects related to the armed forces people like to turn a blind eye to these conversations and i'm hoping that the podcast begins a change in our country especially considering the times that we're living in the more podcasts like this makes you follow us on spotify every episode is available on spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world please send in your guest recommendations from a geopolitics perspective who else would you like to see featured on trs let us know comment down below and share this podcast as far and as wide as is possible lots of love to you guys thanks for your support jai hind